it's like a family and they make everyone in the business feel a part of it. Here's one of the things they do though that's even more important and that is they put a sense of fairness into how to do things. They communicate allowing every family member a voice, a chance to talk about important issues. They make clear information. They make sure every family member knows exactly what's happening in the business. They're consistent on applying the agreements. One cousin has to have a bachelor's degree to go to work at Cargill. So does another cousin. You can't sneak in because your father's the CEO. They've got a minimum standard. You have to go to university if you want to work at Cargill. And you take a job that's open like anybody else applying. We don't make a job because your dad is a shareholder. Changeability, they change the rules when the family feels it's right. And culture is something, the fairness is something they're all committed to. Because they know there's a huge current of conflict in this family. Because at one time, the Cargills owned all three chunks of the company. And one Cargill daughter married a McMillan. So the McMillans had a third and the Cargills had two thirds. There was a son and a daughter left. And somehow, in the estate transfer, the daughter here gave her stock to the McMillan family, and he ended up with one-third Cargill, two-thirds McMillan. That was 100 years ago. There's no one alive. A professor at Dartmouth wrote a book. It's, it's 1,400 pages. He forgets to answer one question. How did that ever happen? Because he couldn't find it out. But so this family is fundamentally at conflict, and yet they work together. So here's a little reason why. Oops, last thing. This is Mr. Canoe's slide. Family agreements. What fair process is, if you want to make it work, is to have some family agreements where you talk about job description and roles, policies for employment, defining ownership rights. You agree as a family what we're going to do. I worked with an Indian family and this was one page. I worked with an Australian family and it was 27 pages. Typically it's two or three pages and the whole family signs off and it's our understanding of how we're going to do things. It's called a family agreement. But more important than that is this. Why do I have this slide up here? It says Cargill in Cuba. Cargill is a huge American company. Why does it say Cargill in Cuba? Because it's against the law for American companies to do business in Cuba. You get fined for doing business in Cuba. But then how can they have this on their website? This was three or four years ago. Because Cargill stands for something, their family values are we feed the world. And so when the United States government said you can't do business in Cuba, Cargill went to the government and they said it doesn't make sense, we sell food. We help people live. You can't use food as a weapon. And the government gave them an exemption. Because the family stands for something. They also feed North Korea, but we're not allowed to say that. Where do you think North Korea gets rice? <laughs> they don't grow any rice there. Who's the only one in the Far East that has the hugest commodities product, you know? So Cargill stands for something, and that's this family values. So if there's a thought I want you to leave with today, it's to start to think about in your family what are the values, as well as how do we improve communications, how do we improve planning, and how do we become more professional? Because family businesses are very special. In fact, I'll argue they're the best. Now, this is a headline from Inc. Magazine. If any of you saw Inc. Magazine in the United States, it's the entrepreneurship kind of Bible. Inc. Magazine is not about being successful. It's about starting a lot of businesses. So you get an Inc. Magazine if you start like 20 businesses, even if 19 of them go out of business. They want to talk about new businesses. This is the only story in 25 years they ever did on family businesses, and the title was Why Family Businesses Are Best. The title was brilliant. All of their points were completely wrong. So I left Leslie's best up there, but I put my points up myself. And here's my points, and I want you to take these with you. One, family is a brand with a face. The relationships are as important an asset as you'll ever have. There's a reason that young Ford does Ford commercials. There's a reason that Terry Pujol is the chairman of Pujol. It's because the family is an important part of what that brand stands for. Number two, families plan in generations. 
which mm -hmm. is a huge competitive advantage when your competitor is planning in 90 day periods because he or she has to meet a stock commitment that was made on Wall Street or on the London Stock Exchange or somewhere else. Number three, families make timely decisions because they can pull it together and make a decision fast. Uh, I have a Chinese family and they tell this story all the time about they were, there was a piece of property in Indonesia that um, one of, it wasn't the family that I know, but another family saw this piece of property and it was a 50 million option to get this piece of property. And Marriott wanted the piece of property to build a hotel. And one of the Chinese the family members that I know, one of his friends called in the morning and he said, can you give me 10 million bucks today? Because he said, I need 50 million by the end of the day to get this property. And the family I know said, sure. And he called three other families and they each put in 10 million apiece, 50 million. And they put the project together, they wrote a check, and they got the option on the property. Marriott got their bid in 90 days later. They turned around and sold the property to Marriott for 10 times more. Because families can move. Because families are decision makers. Because families are in charge. The next generation shakes things up, which we've talked about. Family values drive actions, which we've talked about. Strong cultures support business performance, which we've talked about. And families are identifiable owners who are in charge, which we've talked about. And my favorite, family members share experiences and success. Now, I never told you I came from a family business. We heard about J.P. Morgan being a family business. But I came from a family business. Only I used all of my MBA training in designing my family business. I hired my father to work for me. Is that not smart? But it's a true story. My father was a very senior government official, been a naval officer, and he retired at a young age like all government officials do. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happens here, but yeah, we wish. But generally, government officials get to retire at a nice age. I don't know why. So he retired at a nice age, and he went down to Florida. And he took six or seven strokes off his golf game, and he won that little trophy about this big, you know, at his country club, most improved golfer. Then he started playing tennis again with my mother, and they won the little trophy about this big, best mixed doubles over age 60. And they were having a great time. And then he woke up one day, and he said, okay, golf's all right, tennis is all right, but now what am I going to do? And he was talking to me on the phone, and I said, well, Dad, I'm starting my business. I said, why don't you come up and work for me? And he said, that'd be a great idea. He said, could I do that? And I said, sure. I said, I need help. You see, my father ran a budget of over a billion dollars, and my company at the time was doing a million, so I figured he might add a little bit of intellectual capital. So he came to work for me, and he did all kinds of stuff. He drove the truck, and he helped out every way, and he counted the money because I didn't trust anybody else with the money, and so if I didn't count the money, he counted the money, and that's one of the first rules of family business, right? I wasn't even a professor then, but I knew the first rule, have family count the money. But something interesting happened. After a few days, I noticed my employees were reporting to him. Okay. Now, if it had been a typical situation where I'd been the son and he'd been the father, and I was supposed to be the boss and he was supposed to be my boss, but the employees were working for him instead, then there'd be all this conflict. But because I was the owner and was the boss, I took a step back and I watched. And I figured out something that my MBA was really good, but it didn't teach me how to be a leader. That my father knew how to lead people. He'd go to my employees and he'd say, guys, we need to relay the warehouse. Why don't you figure out the way to do it? If you need help, come and see me. I'm going to leave you alone. Make it work for you. And a few hours later, they'd come back and it'd be perfect. You know how I used to do it? I'd go in and say, I want this here, this here, this here, this here. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I was the boss, so I was in charge. Young manager syndrome. Well, after six months, I learned a lot about management. In fact, I'll make the argument I learned more from my father than I did from my MBA. And at the end of six months, winter came to Minnesota where the business was, and so I had this logical transition of two feet of snow and minus 10 degrees Celsius to push him back to Florida. So my father went back to Florida. I took over my own business, but I took over as a much better leader and a much better manager. And the last thing my father talked about, the last time we were together before he died a couple of years ago, he was telling me a story about when we were running my company together. Well, that's what you have in family businesses. You've got a chance to share the most important things you're going to do, your careers, 
and what you do for the family. And so my argument is we better pay attention to all these things so we don't screw that opportunity up because that truly is a gift. That's a gift that's very special in